He is Paul Hayden, the Managing Director of Avista Partners. Uh, advised Play Jam on $5 million Series A round of investment. And the great thing about having uh, people like Paul and Dan from earlier is after the talk, you can rush them, shake them upside down, and see if any investment falls out <laughs> for you. Uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Paul. Thanks. Um, so I, I've been in an uh, advising game company since 1999, back in the console days and to the digital days now. But also three and a half years ago, as I started investing in game companies um, and set up London Venture Partners with a couple guys. And our first investment was Supercell. Um, and then we've made a few other ones since then. But let's just do quick intros to, for everyone else along here. Hello, uh, I'm Alfonso Villar, CEO co-founder at PlaySpace.com. Uh, we launched the company two years ago, and we self-published uh, multiplayer games for Facebook, web, iOS, and Android, cross-platform games, and they are local games for Spain and Latin America. Yeah, hello, nice to be here. My name is Jan Michel Sachsmeier. I am director of games conception at Bigpoint. We are in the space for about 10 years doing browser and client game for free to play mostly and uh, yeah I'm happy to uh, talk to you today and have a nice chat. Hi everyone I'm Phil Mansell from Jagex Game Studios we're the largest independent developer in the UK and I'm executive producer for RuneScape it's quite a uh, large MMORPG so online RPG game um, What's special about RuneScape, it has amazing retention, and after a decade, over a decade, being released, we still are growing and have um, sort of millions of monthly users. So a lot of that comes from the multiplayer elements. So, so excited to talk about the multiplayer from that point of view. Hello, my name is uh, Michel van der Meer. I'm for the last 25 years a uh, producer for a game company, and uh, I'm representing now Exit Games, uh, and that's the back end of re real-time multiplayer games. And I'm uh, Rick Hendrikman, I'm with GamePoint. GamePoint has been around for a little over a decade and a half now. We do synchronous multiplayer games, it's what we've always done and it's the only thing we do. Um, we do it on the web, we have our own websites in a bunch of countries, we're on Facebook, we're on iPad, uh, we're launching on iPhone. Um, and I'm really excited to, to chat about multiplayer. Great, so let's get started. So just in terms of format, we're, I'm gonna uh, throw out some questions over you know the next time period. We have to finish by 5:30, so probably about maybe 10 minutes before that, we'll start throwing out questions to the uh, to the audience, if not sooner, if we can uh, get through all, all these questions. So, um, maybe start off with Alfonso. Uh, why don't we talk about you know how do you make the decisions on what types of games you're going to make for the future, and you know what format you know are they going to be real time, turn based? Um, and, and maybe, you know, do you, when you're making those decisions, do you base that on what's worked in the past for you or what you think is going to work in the future? Yes, when, well, when we decide to develop a new game, uh, we always uh, look for games that mm, match to our company strategy. That's the first point. And after that, we look for games that we can take more advantage than our competitors, uh, looking for niche. Uh, as we self-publish the games, so we need to, to look for some kind of advantages and localize the game, or in terms of user acquisition, for example, de develop a Brazilian local, very local game. That's, that's the, the most important thing for us. Yeah, at Big Point, we usually give out a mandate for a game when we want to start a new game. Like, uh, we want to do a casual game for female 20 to 40 years, it has to be multiplayer because all our games are multiplayer and we want to do it in client and tablet, for example. And then everybody in the company can come and pitch and also our game designers are doing workshops and working out ideas and they're going to different phases in our stage gate process. And uh, yeah, I think from 20 to 30 ideas, one is coming soon. It's really going to be developed after pre-production. What are the key decision making when you're you're trying to de actually decide? You know, is it sort of um, the type of game, the genre of game, the cost of the game, 
uh, your expectation of this going to be that the Natus Hot thing. I mean, I don't know if everyone knows how many, not that they're, they're a multiplayer, but, you know, like, you know, everyone in the grandmother is launching a Flappy Bird game this week. And so it's just, how do you make those decisions? Okay, so we have a committee from directors and our CEO and other specialists. But before this, we are working out every idea and looking from every aspect, like this, perhaps UX uh, doing uh, some, some surveys or stuff. When we see some risk, we investigate them, and then we, we have the information we need to make our decisions. Okay. And Phil, um, maybe you, you can talk a little bit with this isn't sort of in relation to RuneScape, because obviously you're, you're updating that game and adding stuff to it and adding more content and stuff. I mean, how do you make those, how do you decide? What, what are you going to add? Traditionally, we would talk amongst ourselves, find really good creative sparks, uh, ideas within the team, things people were passionate about, and try and line those up with feedback we had from the games community. So try and match our own ideas with what they want. More recently, we've changed quite radically. Uh, we've introduced a polling system onto our website and into the game itself, and the players pretty much vote on all of the content that we're going to produce, the type of content it is, and they make decisions about um, the story of a quest or the rewards from a mini game or that kind of thing. So we've really kind of democratized um, our release schedule in that way. That's really interesting. Do, do they actually get to see the results? Uh, yeah, I mean, we do a mixture of short-term votes, so small features that might have a one-month turnaround, and then um, roughly once a year, sorry, about twice a year, we have a big marquee feature being introduced to the game. So this summer's new, big new feature was voted on by the players in January. So and they're also going to follow the development all the way through, um, through like developer diaries and videos. So we could really try to make it very interactive, very community driven. That's the first time I've heard of a game company doing that. Is it, so do you believe that's working well for you then? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, we're kind of an evergreen game with a very stable base, but we've been growing in the last quarter. There's a lot of buzz in the community, and when you've got that good sentiment and your players are talking, it kind of leaks out a bit as well, and that enthusiasm um, brings back lapsed players, creates a bit more of a buzz on media websites, and that can bring in new players. So, um, you know, like, happy customers are the key to everything, really. May I jump here? In here, uh, with our old games, we see the same. Uh, the more we're going there into the community and developing the game further with the community, the more the retention is rising again, even with very old games that are seven or eight years old. Yeah. So we can, can see the same here. It's really tapping the community to make decisions on development. Okay. And, and Mitch, do you, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, we, 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 the most things we make is out of frustration. So we, we get some frustration uh, out of the market, and then we, hmm, there should be a market because there are some frustrations. Uh, mostly we, yeah, depending on our clients, we start on uh, a project, uh, for example, Get a Picture, it's an old TV program. Uh, we started in the original state it is, so it's pretty lame if we release something like that. But then we get feedback from uh, our uh, uh, community that says, hey, this is from 20 years old, so can you add this or that or that or that? And so we decide what to do. We started as a real-time multiplayer, but we find out that uh, people want to play with friends. So, okay, we must develop the game like turn-based so that I can do it when I'm playing and the other people are doing it uh, when they are playing. So, yeah, we yeah, track and trail, not... Uh, um, looking what's the best strategy, just throw it uh, into the world. Yeah. It's an open space. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, you have to back to the publisher, please release my game. And now it's, it's all open, so you can try out. It's no problem. It's like a stand-up comedian. He's trying out and look to the audience if they're laughing, and it's not laughing. Yeah, you fail, but yeah. that you learn from it. And, and Rick, you told me yesterday about you know, changing some things in your in your games that had worked out really well from game point? I mean, is it you're just doing sort of constant testing or, or you know, how did you make the decisions to start trying some of this stuff? Um, well, I, I think the first thing we do when we build a game uh, actually is uh, look at the very long term. If we build a game, we want you to be able to play it every single day for the next two years. And if you can't, we're not building it. And at the same time, we're, we're not like 
Jagex or a big point that it constantly adds content. For us, the content is exactly one thing, and that's your opponent, yeah. the, other uh, the other people. The other people are the content. So all we want to do with the game is make sure that you interact with other people, and everything we add to the game that uh, allows you to interact or triggers you to interact um, is stuff we're constantly adding. We, one of the, the most important things we, we uh, look at is how many people chat and how long do they chat and how many, how many characters do they use in chat. And um, everything we can do to increase that is good because however good your game is, um, you know, at, at some point people are going to grow tired. Everything gets old. But relationships never get old. You're, you're always going to want to hang out with your friends. So that's what we're aiming for, and that's what everything we do um, works towards that. Okay. Um, and maybe I'll start off with you with this, with this next stuff. I know this is something that you spend a, a lot of time on is user acquisition. Um, you know, what, what, are, what are the things that you evaluate when you're trying to either find new user acquisition channels or you launching a new game? I mean, what are the... What, what is working well for you? What is not working well for you? Um, I, I think for us, Facebook has been a game changer. It has been a game changer. A lot of our math, you know, uh, cost per install versus customer lifetime, is, is, doesn't really work without Facebook anymore. It's, you need to be able to pull in people's friends, and you need to be able to um, show activity in, in news feed. You, you want to be able to cross sell across devices or platforms uh, by using that Facebook login. Facebook has really changed the game for us. Because, we again, we've been doing this for 16 years, and everybody that has known us for the last 16 years know that since we launched on Facebook, the company has just skyrocketed. And that's because um, it's a great organic discovery platform. Yeah. Okay. And and Mitch, I mean, how do you look at user acquisition? Uh, it, it, yeah, depending uh, again on the, our clients, but uh, uh, regarding to get the picture, uh, it will be launched uh, uh, next year on television again, and uh, um, now we're developing. Uh, um, yeah, we do something like reverse development in this case. We put the old program into the game. We get feedback from the game. We moving the game to the next level, and then we make the TV program back and put it on television. So we make traction back from the television to the game. So it's a, it's a little bit strange, but uh, it's mostly how we work. And uh, I guess uh, you know, maybe I'll just sort of throw it out here. This is you know, so Rick's using Facebook a lot for user acquisition. I mean, wh what are the other user acquisition channels that you guys are using? Affiliate. We lose a, a lot of affiliate, yeah. SEM, SEO, the classical ones here, yeah. Social media as well, yeah, but not so strong for our games. Yeah. And uh, you know, do you do you guys have sort of a um, a balance ratio that you're trying to find between paid for versus viral new users? In terms of you know, are you looking for like 50% viral, 50% paid for, or, or what are you trying to? to hit miles so much. <laughs> I think you can never have enough uh, viral users. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they are for free, so yeah. take them. <laughs> yeah. So no balance. Depends on what user you can get and if they fit to your game, your audience. OK. Um, and so let's talk about analytics a bit. Um, what are the most important metrics for you guys? Yeah, and, and what, what are those? And in terms of what are the metrics that you're looking at and what, and what are the benchmarks that you're trying to hit for those metrics? Well, when we look to from the user acquisition uh, side point of view, we try to look of the whole funnel. Okay, we, we uh, look at the eCPI and the lifetime value. But in a daily basis, we just look on the RPU, uh, conversion rates, um, one day retention, and uh, new installs in a daily basis. When we try to to see if a channel is working better than another one, we look we look at the whole funnel. And you know, for Alfonso or for anyone else, is, is when you're testing a new game, 
um, does it have to, are you looking to hit certain milestones before you actually do a full launch? Um, you know, I only base that on the fact, you know, as an investor in Supercell, you know, it's not really sort of, it's uh, necessarily, it's not real-time multiplayer, it's more, more term-based. If their games weren't hitting a certain retention benchmark, they'd just kill them. They wouldn't even launch them. I'm just curious how you, if you guys look at it that way. I but think, uh, okay, I think, I think in our case, we're, we're pretty bad at this. We, we just throw stuff out there and hope it works. We, we measure tons of things when it's live, and, and luckily, you know, it works more often than not. Um, but we don't do extensive testing before doing a full launch. I think it also has to do with the fact that we're also a bit of a platform. It's never a standalone game. Um, you know, if you ever played one of our games, I think like 40%-ish of the screen of real estate is this messaging app that works across all the games. So it's relatively easy for us to launch a game and get people in it by just pushing them from other games. And if it doesn't really stick and they move back to their original game, it's not that big a deal. Um, we're, we're, we are trying to change our ways, though. We're trying to, to get smarter about this and, and launch in a test market, make sure that like one day retention is really important, seven day retention is really important, but actually also month over month retention because we're, we're not aiming for you know, an average customer lifetime of days or weeks or months. We're going for a year plus. So then um, you know, all these, these time related KPIs become really, really important. Time spent per day is really important for us. Yeah. If it isn't 100 minutes plus, it's not doing well. You're gonna say something, yeah? Uh, yeah, so we have clearly defined phases, like the closed beta, the open beta and stuff, and before we start a project, uh, we have a project contract where we write in the KPIs we want to uh, hit in these phases, and if it's not working out, we, we try to adapt and to change things, and uh, depending on uh, how this is going further or not, uh, we sometimes kill games, or we, we go on then later. They take get more time in, in their phases. Yeah, but in the past we were very bad at this as well. Yeah, yeah. We put out the games just to the market and hope, prayed for the best. So we got a, a little bit smarter now with this. <laughs> so you're you're making decisions faster about about changes to make, whether it's to kill a game or change the games. Yeah. So you you have. Thank you. You have to kill your babies, but uh, you should give them a chance to live. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sometimes it's just some details, some tweaks, and uh, suddenly it, it's working out, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'd like to add something, yeah, because ahead, we are, uh, uh, I came from 20 years uh, back as development, so I'm an old school developer. I, we have to test everything because we came from the console. You cannot return your product or increase or batch or something like that. So we have technical tests, we have a language tests, we have uh, localized tests. And uh, what we find out is that uh, 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 it's not affordable anymore if you release a game, for example, in Europe, or, uh, and you have to test it in Europe. You cannot do it anymore in India because they don't understand the culture. So uh, we stopped uh, with this part, and we are really happy that in nowadays you, yeah, y your audience is your test area, like the guys around me, uh, we have to change to that level, but we still do uh, technical tests before releasing our alpha or beta. And Rick, you, you mentioned how important day one retention is, is to you. I mean, what would you view as sort of a, a day one retention that is not good and a day one retention that's good? 100% is really good. <laughs> <laughs> no. If anyone's got a game with that, please talk to me. <laughs> I think it, it also it depends on the company. Um, our our one-day retention is, is notoriously bad. It's just bad. Yeah. I would want it to be 70. It's not. Yeah. Uh, so 70, I would be really happy. 30 is really low. I think we're roughly halfway down the middle. Um, but we have the luxury position that once people are in, in the platform, they tend to stick around for a very, very long time. 
So now, actually a big part of what we're looking at now in game development is getting that one day retention up because we know we're underperforming there. Yeah. And you just said how long, you know, users stay a long time. I mean, you know, you know, is that you're talking like a couple of years, or what, what are you talking? Actually, the, the average uh, customer lifetime in the Netherlands, and again, keep in mind we've been doing this for 16 years, so it kind of skews the numbers. Uh, the average in the Netherlands is 30 months, um, which is relatively insane. And I know it's really weird, but it's you know if you have 16 years of building up yeah. a player base, um, we have a lot of people still around that were there in the first month we launched. So it kind of skews the numbers. But each, uh, even outside the Netherlands, uh, where we've been doing it for a, le a lot, lot less, uh, less time now, it's, uh, it's 12 months plus, which is still, you know, for an average, it's, it's really, really I good. mean, you, you know you're going to have the lifetime values that you can spend against it. So it just it makes it great. Yeah, I think one of the, the downsides is probably that um, we spend against the lifetime value. Yeah. But because the customer lifetime is really, really long, it also takes quite a while before you start making it back. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's probably the reason that you don't see the hockey stick you see in a lot of the other games where you spend a lot in, in, in the, first, uh, uh, the first couple of weeks or first couple of months because you're making it back in weeks. We're not making it back in weeks. It takes us half a year to earn back cost per install. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, in terms of uh, one day retention, it also depends, of course, on the user acquisition you are doing and also on the platform. For example, we have seen for the same game, we have seen, for example, 40% of one day retention um, on Facebook or web, and then on iOS for the same game, a 60% one day retention. So it's also depending on, on the platform. Uh, the advantage of the multiplayer games is that uh, we have more uh, long-term re retention. Uh, once the, the gamer is engaged with your game, the lifetime is really, really high compared to other single player games. So with the higher retention on, on iOS, are you, are you, you've seen better returns on there then? Yes. That's good. Um, and I guess what, what, uh, one of the other things we're going to ask is, so analytics is incredibly important in this business. I'm just curious, you know, what tools are you using for, an, for analytics? Uh, we're quite fortunate in that we've got both a analytics team inside our product development and we have a data science team that serves the whole business. Okay. Um, stuff that I think is really interesting and I'd recommend other people looking into is finding ways for your um, analytics to not just tell you stuff about your game but allow you to take direct action. So an example that we've been, the two things we've been trialing. Um, one is um, a way to uh, detect, um, predictively detect people that are likely to churn so um, we can run predictive models in real time over the game and potentially intervene on uh, cases where we think players are exhibiting the behaviors that might mean they're going to leave. So that might be um, give, uh, prompting them to use certain features, especially multiplayer features, um, but also directing them to other behaviors that we also statistically know more likely to um, keep them playing, give them stuff that they enjoy. So um, we're really big on the data science side of things. It's very, very helpful, especially when you need that long-term retention. So that's had a, a material impact on your business. Yeah, definitely. We're rolling it out more and more throughout our production systems. Mm. Where do you find these data scientists? <laughs> I'm not telling you that. We <laughs> want them. No, no, well, no I mean, I, I, you know, you, are you just re recruiting them from schools or your experienced people? or um, Both from industry and um, graduate programs. We have internship and graduate programs that we're sort of expanding all the time. We have a, a good mixture of both. Okay, okay. And everyone else, I mean, wh what kind of tools are you using to try and m measure the games? Must I something? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, my clients are really uh, uh, not into that. Uh, they're only looking to the ROI. So, yeah, we spend this money, want this back, and uh, even if I come with uh, the most advanced stuff, they don't look at it. So it's, there's something to get there for them. Uh, e even I wouldn't recommend that strategy for anybody, though. <laughs> But yeah, they make money, so that's, that's important for them. They are from the entertainment industry. It's not compared to the, the, the platforms and the, the big guys around me. Uh, they're making television. Uh, come on, television. 
uh, it's not from this time, but uh, I can't say that from my clients, but it's, they have to evaluate somewhere. But and I, are, are you guys using like in-house tools for analytics? Are you using third-party tools? I mean, what are you guys using? We used Flurry, Google, uh, but my clients don't understand it. So we, we can make uh, numbers for them and they're only looking, oh, uh, okay, uh, how much have it sold? Okay, that's good. And uh, because I think all the guys sitting here, they're looking for long-term relationship with their clients. If you look to the business uh, I'm almost in, they're creating hypes uh, called Big Brother, called uh, uh, all, uh, all kinds of dance programs. And they are not interested to have a long relations with their clients because they, they're on the next hype. So they don't understand what they have to do with the numbers, e mm -hmm. even if you uh, build it in for them. Maybe they should hire someone. Y Jan? Yeah, so we want to have long-term relationships with our clients. Yeah. So some of them pl are playing for years. Uh, so we're having a great um, in-house uh, department for an analysis. I have to say this because some of them are sitting in here. <laughs> I don't know what tools they're using. I only get the numbers. Yeah, Everything yeah, yeah. I want to know. Um, we are focusing more on user tracking in the last year. So we had a lot of knowledge about everything that was uh, currency related, to real currency related. Now we need to more going to more in uh, the direction of profiling and stuff like this. Um, so to talk about user track, I mean, here in Europe, um, the whole cookie thing has become a big issue. I mean, how are you addressing that? That's, that's not my battlefield. Okay. <laughs> I cannot tell you. Okay. Um, go ahead. From our side, uh, we develop our in-house analytics. Well, why? Because uh, um, we think that is the, our core business. Uh, we are running an um, uh, economy into our game, into our multiplayer game. So you need to keep track of your uh, inflation uh, to be care carefully with all the coins you give up by rewards. Uh, so for the moment, 10% uh, of our team is dedicated to analytics. And I hope for the following months it will be at 20%. Uh, and why? Because if you have a guy looking at the metrics, for example, uh, we have found some little problems that we will never see in it. And it's just change one number into the database and we double the revenues. So I think it's really important the uh, analytics also for your user acquisition. If you know which are your players, which are the why, well, who are the ones to, uh, that engage more, you can also use that data for the user acquisition as well. I think it, it, it's interesting that uh, you mentioned the, uh, the fee and the coins you're putting into the economy because for a really, really long time, it was probably the only thing we really, really tracked was the in-game economy. Because it's also, it, it's across different games. Uh, things like a fee change make a huge impact. The amount of coins you give somebody daily, the amount of coins you let friends send each other. Um, it, it was for like a really long time, pretty much the only thing we looked at. And we looked at it daily. Um, I think over the last, a couple of years, we, we started getting smarter about this, and we're also measuring a lot of stuff in-game, like interaction between people, uh, interaction with the game, uh, how many friends do you have, how, many, uh, how much are you chatting, how many characters are you using, uh, when are you chatting, um, stuff, stuff like that. We, 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 we learned that you can never have too much data. And um, we still use quite a lot of stuff we built in-house, but it's also, it, at a point, you either need to hire a data team or, or put some stuff at a third party. Uh, and we're using uh, Contagion for the web now, which is working, working quite nicely. But you have to be smart about what you want to send them beforehand. So um, there, there's something to say f for doing it in-house, but it, it's relatively resource in intensive. So it sounds like most of you guys have sort of built a lot of your in-house stuff. And use third-party stuff a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's what we do. Just a, just a thought on that. Um, uh, choosing the right tools is definitely really important, and if you need to make your own, um, th that's great. Um, what I found is that uh, it's just as important to make sure your staff, your creative culture can embrace analytics and not be kind of intimidated or 
disenfranchised by it. We've kind of come on a journey where um, we're in a place now where quite a lot of our creative leads want the information. They're not like being fed stuff by an analytics team like foisted upon them. They're going out and searching for stuff. And I think um, to have that culture in the company, especially in more traditional developers, is quite a challenge. So um, that's really important, I think. OK. Um, so just I think we, we were sort of leading into it is just you know, talking about monetization. It'd be good to hear from you guys. I mean, how are you making money with your games? You know, are your games free to play, subscription? Why are you using that model? Um, you know, how do you get people to start spending money and, and so on? If you could just comment on that. Well, in our case, our freemium games, free to play games, uh, people have, uh, we have to choose of two currencies, the soft currency and the hard currency. The soft currency is to play and we with the daily bonus and we can reward that, co that currency and we have the hard currency for virtual goods staff to improve their game experience, power up, boosters or whatever. Um, the virtual goods for us, it takes 10% uh, of revenues. Uh, and what was that? The, the virtual goods. Okay. The hard currency. Yeah. Uh, so people love to play, wants to play. We spend the money and, and play more. And we also monetize through advertising because okay. Uh, it's really difficult to monetize, to convert players into players, sorry, players into players yeah. in, in this business model. So we have that kind of solution as well for the non-players. For both um, online and mobile. Exactly. Okay. We also do make uh, some A-B testing uh, of, okay, we are uh, going to be aggressive with the advertising or not. Uh, you can do A-B tests and see if the engagement goes down or up and make your own decisions. That's why you need an analytics team to... And do you find um, that the percentage of, of paying players versus your, all your players is different on, on mobile versus uh, online? Yes, of course. In a better way? In a better way than mobile ones. That's interesting. It depends also on the payment methods, okay? If uh, iPhone, you have the, the credit card over there. It's, yeah. it's one-click payment. So, yes, it helps a lot. Yeah, Yeah. okay. Uh, we have done free-to-play ever since, and uh, we will stay with it. Uh, the uh, interesting thing we are seeing here is that the patterns and uh, the, the free-to-play features we are having there for monetization are changing. The users are adapting over the years. So with some of our old games, we really are changing the whole monetization system and refreshing them to the market and to the target group. Yeah? So there's no general pattern where I could say this is the best to do. Depends really on the game, on the, on the audience type, and really how old the game is as well. So the last time we were very busy to change monetization systems, which were perhaps three or four years old and worked very fine by that time, and now the market has changed and we have to redo them. But this is kind of part of the process in uh, having games as a service over a longer time. And yeah, are you um, having games in the, or ads in the games as well? Did you sell advertising in the games as well? Yeah, we have uh, advertising as well, but n no, no side banners or something like this. We don't like this. We have more integrational things like in some games we have product placements, which is well, very well received by the users. If it's good uh, embedded into the gameplay and into the game, if it fits. Also, we have some features like a cinema where people can go to and see some advertising movies and get some real currency out of this. And, uh, the users really want this, so uh, we don't get enough uh, movies <laughs> for them. So they're complaining that they cannot look more there. Yeah? So this is really working out well. The, yeah, the, um, the videos that run in games they tend to pay out pretty well, too. The payout isn't very high, but it's enough to give out some recurrency as well yeah. to the users. So it's, it's a good, good uh, yeah, revenue we're doing there. Phil? Um, RuneScape's a, fun, a funny one because it was one of the first free-to-play games on the market just at all back in sort of 2003, 2004. Um, and I think it also shows that uh, even with an established game, you can upgrade the business model over time. So a couple of years ago we introduced, so I'm sorry, RuneScape is a free-to-play game. It has a subscription layer and was like that for most of its life. And a couple of years ago we introduced additional optional microtransactions, so e extra services you can buy onto the top. 
actually on things like advertising, we're starting to add in things like offer walls as well to kind of um, allow p players to um, uh, still get access to the premium things, even if they don't have the, the cash directly available. Um, something we've put in the game quite recently is an ability for um, one player to buy membership and then to sell their membership for in-game currency to another player. It's quite interesting. It kind of allows your, your whales to subsidize your free players. Um, it's quite a c kind of clever loop that it creates. Um, EVE Online has done this as well. It's quite good within um, that kind of genre. What, what age group are, are you, do you have predominantly p playing in your games? Um, uh, the core user group is 18 to 24 year olds. Really? Wow, I thought it was younger. That's, that's interesting. Okay. I mean, we've got um, an average um, account age of over five years, so there were quite a lot of people who joined in their mid-teens, yeah. and they're all now in their early 20s, but most of our new acquisition is in that age group as well. And Mitya? Yeah, it's, uh, a good example is, uh, um, personally, I believe in free-to-play and item selling and the free world, the people who have time and spend time and people who have money and want to have quality time, that is really what I believe in. But uh, actually, we're working with uh, old school publishers who uh, are complaining uh, about the, the, the educational books they give out that uh, in, the, in the store, the normal store, you have to pay uh, 8 euro for the extra content. And digital, you only pay 80 euro cents or something like that. Uh, I get in big discussions uh, with the, uh, this publishers and every time are struggling and tell them that they have to move to the new world, uh, that you have people that have uh, free time and like to spend, and otherwise the people who have money and like to spend. But uh, it's, it's very hard for us to, to move to that part, even if I like it, and I see it's, it should be the future. Rick? Um, we're, we're free to play. Uh, we've always been free to play. We have virtual currency. Uh, we have a, subscri a subscription model which gives you certain aesthetic uh, advantages over other players. Um, as a member, you get uh, a bonus on all virtual currency uh, uh, purchases you do. And the, the revenue generated by actually selling the subscriptions is maybe one and a half percent of total value uh, of total revenue, but the revenue generated by subscribers is 20, 25 percent. So um, the actual subscriptions don't bring in a ton of money, but they are the most loyal players. And and the funny thing is that you would think we get pretty big bonuses to subscribers. Like uh, you have two levels, and it's a 50 or 100 percent bonus. And you would think you know you get twice as much. Maybe you spend twice as less, but they spend a lot more. Um, so that's that's how we do it. Okay. Um, are there any questions that you guys want to ask each other before we open it up? I can ask one. Okay. Um, uh, what are the risks that you guys find in adding multiplayer to your games? Like, what are the? Do you have to worry about the extra costs that it creates, or um, worries about the users? Yeah, so having multiplayer games is uh, it's make it complicated. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, things you can abuse. Then, so like, let's start with game design. You have a game, and uh, this game, you are single player, and there's a wall. You cannot get over it because it's higher than you. But suddenly there are two guys, and they are, have the ability to interact and help themselves on the shoulder of the other one, and he's over the wall. Yeah, so. Uh, this, this is a problem. Game designers really have to think about it. Uh, what are the possibilities? What will happen when I give the players the ability to connect each other to trade, for example? There's a huge potential of, uh, of fraud there. We had some cases when we opened marketplaces or, or trading uh, posts in our games that people did fake accounts, did debit banking there pushed all the great stuff they bought, they're over to the, their main account and then their fake account was closed by the system because it, they canceled the debit, but it was already too late. So this is all the stuff you have to think about, yeah. Additionally, there comes the whole technical stuff you need there, but I think uh, you can, you all can add some stuff here. I, I, I think that the, the biggest, uh, we all do synchronous multiplayer uh, and synchronous multiplayer is expensive. It's you need a lot of people, you need a lot of technology. Um, 
There was this great article about uh, League of Legends a while back on, on Pocket Gamer um, that talked about how their community turns really toxic and sometimes. And I'm pretty sure that everybody that does synchronous multiplayer and allows people to chat knows this. Um, y you, you're, usually your most loyal players can turn really, really toxic and, and really ruin the experience for other people. Because I, I mentioned how other players are content but that also means that other, those players have a real impact on the experience of other people. So if somebody's really negative, um, that can cost you a player. So actually, I think that the biggest team within our company is the, the uh, community management team. Uh, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of man hours to, to manage that. Um, so that, that's probably, for us, the biggest downside. I think uh, we have three biggest challenge in multiplayer games. The first one is w which I call the empty bar problem. Uh, we, you need, when you launch a game, you need a critical mass that makes that game uh, start to work. So for example, I call it the empty bar because if you enter in a bar and it's no, maybe it's a really good bar, but it's if, if it is nobody there, you go out. So if you're you, uh, making user acquisition and you don't put it all together, uh, you will have that problem. Once you solve that problem and you have a lot of users playing at the same time, you have the problem of the concurrency. You have to be a, a very skilled uh, developer and also from the game design aspect. Uh, so how will you manage uh, the matchmaking, the chats, etc.? And also when you have a big community, how do you, if people are all together, they fight everyone, uh, a lot of discussion, so you have to to have a lot of team of community as well. These are the three main challenges we have experienced. Yeah, I, I really like the expression "empty bar problem" yeah. because we, we traditionally we're like a Dutch company. We we've been around for 16 years, but for most of the time we were just in the Netherlands. And when we first launched, and we did this in uh, Denmark, which is tiny, so it's just a bad idea. Uh, when we first launched. Um, Traditionally, our company has grown by having uh, content partnerships with a lot of websites. They would place our games on their website, we would share revenue, and that's how we grew in the Netherlands, but we were the only ones. Uh, and we did the same thing in Denmark. We traveled up and down and had partnerships with the biggest websites in Denmark. And everybody turned it on at the same time, and nothing happened. Because people would trickle in, but they would never find somebody to play the game with. It just, there, we didn't have the critical mass. And actually, the moment it started working was when we threw Denmark out the door, made everything English, uh, bought a bunch of Facebook ads, and just pushed in thousands and thousands and thousands of people in a couple of hours. That's, that's why it worked. I think the empty bar problem is really dependent on your game and your game mode. Like match-based game with the matchmaking system are very vulnerable to this, yeah? So like League of Legends or World of Tanks, uh, the quality the user has in his matches really depends on the matchmaking here. When the matchmaking pool is very, very small, then there will be long waiting times or in worst case, uh, new players will be bashed by pro players and they will quit the game because they're frustrated. So uh, other game types are not so vulnerable to this, but yeah. So you, you, you really either have to have some amazing viral stuff happening or you have to, you have to spend money up front to, to deal with that. Yeah, and uh, you have to time it right with your uh, CRM sending out all newsletters at once. The game has to be at the perfect point at this moment that it really can take the users and works pretty well and uh, yeah, you have to time it right with all your channels you have to get this critical mass. Any more questions from you guys? No, I, I can add something about uh, uh, turn based it's okay, you, you can handle that, but if you really do something real time, it, it's really a pain. Not only, uh, the, the most developers think that you will, it will cost you a CP, uh, 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 yeah, CPU power, but actually what will kill you is the traffic and the cost of traffic, uh, or data traffic in this, uh, this kind. And having the players at the same time and managing that and scaling up and scaling down, it's, it, it's hard. Um, that is one of the reasons we uh, yeah, changed some strategy of the games to turn-based. Because turn-based is 
much easier to handle to, uh, uh, if you have a small community and you like to start. So for indie developers, uh, having real-time multiplayers uh, uh, and having success is, yeah, it's, it's another league. It's uh, something yeah, the guys here have experience with and yeah, you must think big, otherwise it will not work. I love the idea of the uh, empty bar problem. I've got a different version of it, which is the school disco problem, which is everyone's <laughs> turned up, but no one's talking to each other. Um, uh, we, we have that a little bit, and we've needed to um, think of quite clever ways to get players to talk more, get used to the social systems in the game. Because we know from all our studies that the more people play together, the more they talk. And this isn't just uh, anecdotal, like we measure everything. The more, on an analog scale, the more people talk, um, the much more likely they are to stay in game and refer other people and that kind of thing. So finding ways to spur on your users to, you know, politely interact with each other is, is really, it's not that expensive to do, but um, it can be quite a tough design challenge. But it really pays off if you can crack it. The overcrowded disco is also a problem. Right. <laughs> Why don't we open it up? You go ahead. some solutions. So what do you guys think about the ghost playing? Is that something you consider? That's, that's a great idea when it fits to the game mode. So you have some asynchronous components with some synchronous gaming. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's nice, yeah. But it doesn't fit to every game type, yeah. I think um, most platforms, um, certainly on mobile, you're going to have a built-in leaderboard. Obviously, you've got Game Center. Um, it's quite of the multiplayer components you can get, putting in sort of um, somewhat passive and asynchronous um, competition mechanics are they're like a really good first step. Um, I think the ghost idea works, but as you say, it depends very much on the genre. Yeah, bots can help as well in some games. Yeah, types, so we, yeah. we have bots. But bots are a huge invest because you have to make good bots or they don't work. So, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. From our side, we we use them and it helps us a lot. That's good. Okay. For for turn based, yes. For real time multiplayer, it's f it's in hell because it's not the same player experience and you lose players and you have high acquisition costs. So in my opinion, if you can afford it, no, don't do that. I, I think it's probably, it's about the game. It has to be the right type of game. Uh, we're, about, uh, we're all about having human interaction and you can never have human interaction with a ghost. Um, so actually, what we <laughs> so actually what our, when we first launched in Germany, what happened was that the people in our German office would just be online 24/7 to make sure that there were always people to play against. They might, you know, need to be woken up to play, but they were there to play against. Yeah, but you know, in a, in a new game for an indie game developer, uh, even in the beginning, for the first thousand players, you don't have anybody to play with. Uh, that's a very difficult, uh, um, you know. Thing to solve, uh, and on top of it, for you again, I have a question. Um, the uh, you talked a bit about chat and how you cross promote users uh, through their communication. Um, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about this chatting option? How do you uh, let your players be more social in the game? And again, with this uh, situation of no no online players all the time. Um, we now have, we're now the size where there's always somebody there. That really helps. It was really an issue at the, at the start, especially the chat part. Um, I think one of the, the mistakes people make, um, a couple of years back, chat was pretty hip and happening and everybody just stuck chat on a single player game. And it's not about having chat, it's about building your game about human, around human interaction. Uh, a lot of it is about pacing. A lot of it is about pacing your game. You have to have time to interact. You have to have triggers to interact. Um, one of the, the most interesting examples is probably our, our, uh, our bingo game has a, a manual and an automatic mode. 
the automatic mode is just sitting there watching numbers being daubed and all you can do is chat. But in the manual mode, we, would, we used to have the issue that if people are marking a number every couple of seconds and they're really concentrated, they wouldn't be chatting. Um, so there's actually a very deliberate delay between bingo rounds where people congratulate each other, uh, interact, and then that interaction kind of dies down in the, the couple of minutes that the round lasts and then it comes back up uh, during those pauses in the game. And the pause in the game might seem weird to people because uh, it's quite long and um, the, the faster your rounds are, the higher your turnover of virtual currency is. So there, there's, uh, there's definitely, uh, people are tempted to make it faster uh, and we keep, we're keeping it slow quite deliberately to, to enable that interaction. And it's just an example of how you, from A to Z, think about how to get people to interact in your game. Yeah, um, as you said, this can be toxic as well, yeah. So um, if you have a game, a multiplayer game with a frustration level of, uh, let's call it Frappy Birds, yeah. <laughs> um, this can be toxic very, very fast that people are insulting each other, don't know what. So I've seen that uh, Blizzard's Hearthstone card game, they did it very well for this, yeah? So there are often matches where you get bad cards and you lose anyway, whatever you do, and this is very frustrating, so and So they have no open chats there, yeah? They have chat emotes, where you can have a rough conversation, but you cannot say, yeah, you're only lucky and you suck and stuff like this, it's impossible. So this is really tailored to the game experience, and this is an important part here, I think, yeah? There are games that which, where you need a full chat, and this is good, and there are games who need solutions like this. Right. Yeah, that's uh, the same example of uh, wrong using chats. We created a bingo game. It's not a bingo game for my neighbor, but uh, we thought also to add chat on it because we saw on other channels that they congrats each other and stuff like that. We make really uh, good chat uh, uh, session. But what we saw, what we saw is that people are going to chat, and uh, at the end we were something like a Facebook channel where you can uh, uh, have a real-time chat and we didn't earn any money anymore because they were focusing on chatting and not uh, on bingo playing anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I, I mm -hmm. think that's, that, that's interesting because we have bingo and we have chat and the way we got around that problem is um, by making... Status is a really big thing in our games and if you monetize through, through virtual currency and the way we do it where you put up a stake and then we take a cut and then you get more virtual currency back, the only way for us to make uh, money off of you is if you bet more. It's not actual betting, it's virtual currency, but there's really, for most people, there's not much of a reason to bet more. And the only reason we get, uh, in, we've put in the game for people to bet more is, is status, you see for every player there, you see the amount of virtual currency they have. And in a room of 200 players, where you spend 200 minutes a day and you're there five years, it suddenly becomes an issue where you are on that list. And if you want to be high, you have to bet high or spend a lot of money. Both are fine, both is fine with me. Um, so, so that's where we got a, around that problem by uh, making it visible how quote unquote, successful you are in the game and uh, making state is a really big part of the experience. I, I got a little side story here. Uh, we just discovered that in our uh, female farming game, Farmerama, the message system is used as a dating site. What? <laughs> yeah, but we uh, let it that way because it's good for retention, yeah? Yeah, right. yeah same happened uh, in our games. People just came to the chat and asked uh, uh, for their kids or whatever. So. The, the chat helps to create community and they create uh, right. groups of people inside of it. So I think chat is very important. The only question is where you put it. Uh, what we did, uh, we created tournaments. So every tournament lasts for a few minutes. In any kind of game, you can have a tournament. Even in bingo, you can have like a 10 minutes game. And then uh, we let the players chat at the beginning or at the end of the game. So while they play, they can focus on the game, but chatting is available right after. Uh, to make uh, to let the people be more social right after they finish the game, and then they can uh, talk about the game, show off, and so on. And I think that that could be another solution. But thanks. Any other questions? Hi, uh, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on cheaters or hackers and the influence uh, of that on leaderboards and tournaments. We hate them. <laughs> 
Agree. You have to be really strict. Um, our, our game had quite a big problem a number of years ago with this, and we had a range of techniques we tried to use. Um, at the moment, we have a very sophisticated behavioral analysis system that can detect bots and cheaters. And it's so important that you don't, it's not just about kicking them out, it's about showing other players that you're kicking them out and making it really visible. So within our fantasy game, we have a giant hand of God that points at them and, and it makes them one of the baddies. But it, it's good because it, it not just deters other people, but it kind of validates um, the fact that they're playing properly. So I think both sides are important. Yeah, I, I think you, you need to do something. Uh, a good example is one of our card games, uh, Klaver Yassa. If you're Dutch, you know this game. Um, one of our card games, we didn't really handle the cheating thing, and suddenly, like the third hit when you searched for our Dutch platform would be uh, claviasacheaters.nl, where they would just list people that they would find cheating. Uh, so we kind of had to step in there. But there's, there's a limit to what you can do. Uh, I mean, our, our darts game is uh, timing based, where you stop uh, a marker in the middle of a bar to throw it at a certain place on the dartboard. And people cheat at that game by uh, sticking stickers on their uh, computer monitor so they know where to stop the bar. Yeah, that's, that's really out of our hands. But it's definitely an, an issue. Yeah, you, you really have to be on top on it. We underestimated it. Uh, in one of our games, we had a bot problem. And to fight against bot is a huge invest because there, is, there are teams who are earning their money with it to sell bots to our players, so you have to be smarter than them. And we underestimated it, and uh, the revenues of this game uh, were going down on by 30% in half a year because of this matter. And then we, we, we took up the fight, and in the end we won, and like we, we, we had this giant hand of God and campaigns and the community is really appreciating this and now revenues are going up again are okay now so really don't underestimate this yes uh, you have to be very uh, strict uh, and don't uh, don't allow cheats because it can break your economy uh, if a user uh, knows a bug to exploit your system maybe it can start to uh, give uh, free gifts to everywhere to everyone and break down your economy uh, fr from our side, we developed the logic of the games from the backend side, uh, so players could only cheat if they find uh, a bug on our on our logic game. For example, uh, if they create several accounts and they move money from each account to another, so we are really strict with the IP as well. We don't let them uh, compete each other. Uh, for currency or gift uh, uh, to another play that is under the same IP as well. Yeah, and uh, don't be afraid of banning, even whales. You really should do it, yeah? So we were afraid, but we saw it's better that way. Yeah? Then you lose a whale, but you win 10 other players. And most of the whales are buying back in then, we saw. So that has a double effect, yeah. I yeah, think just, yeah. yeah, that was on that issue, like uh, if you do auto like automatic behavioral targeting and then end up kicking and banning people. Did that ever backfire seriously on you? Like, was there a problem where you kicked and banned people who just maybe spend too much <laughs> and you thought were cheaters? No, you have to be 100% sure that they are cheaters or using bots. That's very important. So you have to invest in investigating and writing tools, making queries, whatever, to find this out. This is. If if you got people who weren't guilty of this, this is this will have a huge community backfire. So you have to make your homework there. Thanks. Well, that's it. We're we're all done here. Thank you very for everyone. And I just wanted to say a couple things first before you go. Is um, Game Point is having a big party tonight? Um, feel free to ask Rick about where it is and all the details. And. Um, I think that's that's it basically. Oh yeah, there's uh, there's free alcohol downstairs now. <laughs>